Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. And I want to just reiterate what Ninian was mentioning earlier, that it's great to be in front of a, uh, an audience. And I have no excuses for being on mute. So, uh, so I'm very happy to be here. Also, I can confirm that I live in Germany, and I am a very satisfied Vodafone customer. So, uh, so Ninian should be happy with that one. Um, yeah, what I would like to just mention today is, is just talk a little bit about the Lufthansa experience during the crisis, during what happened. Um, personally, I feel very privileged to have lived through the past 18 months, which actually sounds a very uh, paradoxical thing to say, particularly in a large aviation group. But hopefully, you'll understand over the next few minutes why, why that is. So, um, what I want to do is I want to provide, basically highlight what happened, uh, the positioning of procurement, uh, where procurement was before in terms of its reputation within the Lufthansa Group, in terms of its capabilities, in terms of its systems, and where we are now. And uh, one of the mantras that we had during the past 18 months is, let's not waste a good crisis. So we're starting to see the fruits of that, the fruits of that now. So just to take a quick look of, of the Lufthansa Group, who we are, um, BC, before COVID. So we're actually Europe's largest aviation group. We're not just Lufthansa, the airline, um, but we also have other airlines within our portfolio. So we have Austrian Airlines, Swiss. Uh, we also have Eurowings, Brussels Airlines. Uh, we have Eurowings Discover, which we've actually just launched in the past few, past few months. Um, we're calling it a warm water airline. So, we are, so Eurowings Discover only flies to destinations where the ocean temperature is, is greater than 25 degrees. So hopefully you have a chance to, to, to fly with them. Um, we also have Lufthansa Cargo, and we carry, in normal years, um, around 2 million metric tons of freight around the globe. And of course, the, the cargo activity during the crisis actually became our only profit center. Um, and actually, it was very important to, for the transportation of things like ventilators and uh, ultimately vaccines. Uh, then, of course, we have our Lufthansa Technik, um, which is based in Hamburg in Germany. Um, we actually have 4, 000, over 4,600 aircraft under contract there, um, not only from the Lufthansa Group, of course, so many other airlines rely on the Lufthansa Technik for the maintenance, the repair, and the overhaul of the aircraft. Um, and we have, a, we have a, a catering unit, which in fact we're in the process of outsourcing. But in 2019, um, LSG Sky Chefs uh, was still fully part of the group, serving over 700 million meals uh, to, our, to our passengers. So a pretty big group um, and very exposed in case there would be a crisis. So, and that's actually what happened, as we all know, in beginning of 2020. And this slide here gives an overview of uh, basically the impact for the group. Now, ob obviously many of you work in different industries and you've been impacted by the crisis in, in different ways. And I'm not here to say that uh, Lufthansa was any worse or, any, or needed any special treatment, um, but it's just the experience and I think just to put this into context, because when I come to talk about the positive experience of the crisis in terms of how we came together, what we did as a procurement organization, um, how we reacted towards our supply base, I think it's useful to, to put this into, into context. So on this graph, you can see here the, um, the, offered and seat, the offered and sold seat kilometers basically fell off a cliff around March of 2020. Um, and walking into the office, in our Frankfurt headquarters, just by the airport. Um, during those first weeks of, of, of end of February, beginning of March, it was pretty depressing, I have to say. And this is what perhaps this graph doesn't, doesn't show. We were almost in a state of shock, I would say. We had, um, from one day to the next, it was just bad news after bad news. We were closing down our operations. There were no, um, I always remember the day when, we closed down our transatlantic operation. So basically, business, our business class operation across the Atlantic uh, to the United States is, is the most profitable part of the Lufthansa Group's operations. You close that down, it has a huge, huge impact. 
And then we talk about the, the human impact. We talk about going on to furlough. In Germany, we call that Kurzarbeit, so basically the, the situation where we lose a lot of our team. Um, and they are contributing because they're contributing by conserving cash in the group. Um, but of course, this has a huge impact. It has a huge impact, uh, like a, a psychological, personal impact on the teams. Um, so we were in a pretty dire position uh, in the second quarter of last year. And when I talk about dire position, we're talking about close to insolvency. And without giving away any trade secrets, we were pretty, pretty close. We were having discussions about, well, will next month's salary be paid, for example. So, that's, um, so it, was, it was pretty close to the wire. Um, uh, fortunately, our finance teams were able to put into place the necessary uh, actions, and we got support from the German, the Swiss, the Austrian, and the Belgian governments, and we're in the process of, of paying back now the loans. Um, just last week, uh, we've issued debt into the market, which will enable us then to pay back uh, the contribution and that has enabled us to get through the crisis. So this is a little bit the context. And when we talk about minus 90% of the flights, and, min and the 98% figure there, by the way, um, that's the passenger revenue. So basically, yeah, we only had 2% of what we had in the same, at the same time of the previous year. So, pretty dire. Um, so, in terms of EBIT, it wasn't great. But what was even worse was the cash situation. Because we realized pretty early on in April of last year that we were burning cash pretty seriously. And what was quoted in the press and what was quoted often by our CEO, Karsten Spohr, is we were burning through 1 million euros of cash per hour. Um, which is, so, and in procurement, in the supply chain, we had our role to play there. We had, because our supply, our payment tap was pretty much always on. Uh, we had daily payment runs, yeah? So many of you will have a weekly payment run or a monthly payment run. In Lufthansa, we had daily payment runs to our suppliers. So we, cash was just bleeding out of the business and then we were not, getting the, the revenues to come in to compensate for that. So, and this is the situation that we faced in, um, in, in April of last year. And so, in order to react to this, um, we built something called the cash office, and I'll come on to the cash office in just a second. Um, but one of the first reactions from one of our senior leaders in, in the finance organization was to say, well, let's just stop paying our suppliers. Yeah, so easy, just turn off the, turn off the tap stop paying the suppliers. Um, and that happened uh, in the second half of March. I had that conversation um, with, that, with the, the person. And um, it was a, a serious discussion. Fortunately, one week later, a very well-known German sportswear company, begins with A, um, they got into a lot of trouble because they actually stopped paying their supplies. And in fact, they, specifically, they stopped paying the, um, the rent on their retail location. Some of you may remember that. It was in the press. Um, it got a lot of bad reputation, a lot of, a lot of reputational damage for the aforementioned company. So that put an end to that debate within the Lufthansa Group. We knew that in order to get through this crisis, we needed to contribute as much as possible in cash conservation. But at the same time, we also needed to ensure that we were protecting the supply base and also protecting the reputation of the group. And therefore, this is where, this is where we found our niche, if you will. This is where we found our ability to, to get leverage and traction within the, within the crisis, and procurement's profile was all of a sudden raised up. So we had to stop the cash bleed. We had to reinforce resilience in the supply chain. And let me just come back to that balance we had to strike. So for, on the one hand, we had certain suppliers out there. And we, within the Lufthansa Group, we have around 40,000 suppliers. We had some suppliers that were doing OK in the crisis. We have suppliers, for example, in the IT sector that actually did quite well out of the crisis. And their, their, their own financial position was not so much impacted. So we could afford to be very aggressive with those suppliers. But we also had certain suppliers that were very fragile, that were solely dependent on the aviation business. And of course, when the whole aviation sector goes down, yeah, uh, a, a, a receding tide lowers all the boats. So basically, 
we needed to have this kind of bespoke approach, which was very labor intensive, but it actually worked out in the end. And thirdly, we needed to pivot our resources and our thinking to support modified supply needs. So we were no longer in the business of um, negotiating and doing our supply chain management with our catering suppliers, for example. We, we weren't serving any, any, any meals. Our in-flight entertainment uh, contracts, for example. So Lufthansa, for example, we, we, nego we actually negotiate sometimes with the Hollywood uh, film studios, believe it or not, uh, for in-flight entertainment content. Um, of course, that was, we don't do that anymore during the crisis. But what we did have to do was to think about um, what we're doing with cargo loading devices, temperature-controlled cargo loading devices for the transportation of vaccines, for example, uh, warehousing facilities for our, um, uh, car, uh, for our logistics operations. So this became very much, very much to the fore. So we had, to, we had to pivot there a bit. And then we come back to the cash office. So the cash office was an institution, or it was, a, it was set up as a structure which was established uh, by the board of the group um, uh, in March. And the purpose of the cash office was to manage the crisis from a financial perspective. And um, I had the role to lead one of the modules there, the supplier management module. And uh, so we were working across functions uh, within the cash office, and we had a daily call, 8 o'clock every morning, in German, not so good, um, uh, for about six months to uh, manage the crisis and go through, and go through this uh, situation. So in, not, not only in terms of supplier management, but also looking at the, our overall liquidity um, to ensure that um, the negotiations with the banks were... Uh, and the uh, governments of the uh, four home countries uh, were, were going to plan. But in supplier management, we were focusing on extension of payment terms and the closing out of open liabilities. And um, this gave us, this gave procurement an enhanced role, an increased profile in the company. Um, if I had spoken uh, in 2019 about the role of procurement within the Lufthansa Group, a lot of people have said, yeah, you're there to issue purchase orders, negotiate a few contracts, perhaps negotiate contracts that I've, as a demand organization, have previously negotiated, been in contact with the supplier. But all of a sudden, procurement, we were there to be more proactive, to deliver value. And that was very important. So we also looked at offsetting. So we had certain suppliers that were also our customers. So for example, we have um, travel agents, for example. So travel agents give us money from the ticket sales, but we give the travel agents money sometimes incentive payments um, for, uh, uh, for business travel in particular. So we had both creditors and debtors, and we, and we wanted the ability to optimize cash, and that involved a lot of data management, a lot of bringing together different back-end data from our different SAP systems, and of course, uh, Lufthansa Group, you can imagine we have different SAP systems for different entities in the group. So the ability to offset liabilities uh, or payables against receivables from the same uh, supplier across different parts of the group was something we, we had to do. So what, did, what actually did we do on the ground? So pretty early on, we changed our payment run from daily to weekly. And that may not seem a lot, but that gave us a little window of time every week for us to generate the data to run a report which then uh, uh, highlighted all of the payments that were due the following Wednesday, because it was a Wednesday to Wednesday situation. From the Thursday through to the Monday, we distributed this data to all of our category managers, to all of the team leads and the buyers, and they went through line by line all of these outgoing payments, and they were ident we were identifying anything which we could extend. So basically anything where we could, uh, we could uh, conserve the working capital of the company, of the group, as much as possible. Yeah, and we went through line by line, and then uh, um, I was involved in conversations with our category leads and with our cluster managers 
and with our uh, um, business unit uh, chief procurement officers to go through the top 50 suppliers of, on that list and basically encouraging pushing out as, as much as possible. But it worked, so we were very aggressive, yes, but for sure, when we identified a supplier, for example, a family-run uh, ground transportation supplier, so the shuttle buses, for example, that run the cabin crews from the, from the airport to the hotel. Now, those types of companies, family-run businesses, we can't move their, their, their payments from 30 days to 150 days, they would go bust. So we were very conscious um, to pay on time or in some cases pay early uh, for those types of suppliers. But nevertheless, we were able to generate what we called a bow wave. So basically these are all these extended payments that we were pushing out and out and out um, to get through these, these early months on the crisis. And we didn't, and that was one of the key situations is we didn't really know when it was going to end. Um, this, so, so nobody really knew, nobody really knew. So, but we wanted to push out as much as possible. And, they, and those figures there give you an idea of the, the sorts of volumes that we were talking about. So we were checking roughly somewhere between five and 6,000 invoices a week. Um, we were also closing out open liabilities. So basically open purchase orders which created a debt on our balance sheet. We wanted to close these out. Some things which were going back to, you know, 2017 or 2018, we took the opportunity. Never waste a good crisis, right? So you're uh, closing out these open liabilities, cleaning up the balance sheet, yeah? And we were able to close out over 750 million euros worth of, of open liabilities there. Yeah. And um, so our CPO, so my boss, Angela, she um, was very um, conscious and one of her, about, she was very conscious about us keeping our moral compass, making sure that we were treating the supply chain equitably and fairly. And thanks to that, we were able to get through the crisis without one single um, uh, complaint from a supplier, or, one, or no supplier took us to court because we were paying late. We, everything was done through mutual consent, and we were actually able to build long-term partnerships in our supply chain, um, thanks to, to uh, this kind of very bespoke approach. So that worked actually very, very well. And now, of course, what are the key learnings? Well, thanks to what we've done in the crisis, our mission, our vision 2025, as we call it, within procurement, uh, has actually been accelerated. So when we went through the crisis, we didn't really, we thought, oh no, we have to put everything on hold to get over the crisis. But in reality, what's happened is that a lot of our strategic objectives in terms of things like um, acting more strategically with regards to our category strategies, um, uh, taking, extending the scope of procurement beyond EBIT-based measures towards um, cash optimization, for example, um, uh, elevating the role of procurement in the organization to deliver more value, getting more innovation from our supply chain through procurement, where procurement is the catalyst, we are proactive. So that's actually all of that that's been accelerated by what's happened in the past 18 months. So there were three main tenets to our approach during the crisis. We had what we called the zero-based approach. So zero-based approach is basically going to see the demand organization, the internal customer, and saying, okay, let's think about, for example, um, uh, let's think about crew hotels. So in the past, crew hotels, yeah, been four or five star properties, nice hotels. Why don't we start from a blank sheet of paper, a zero-based approach? What is the absolute minimum that's required in order to have a secure, comfortable place to stay, but we can reduce the cost there? And we did that across very numerous categories. And we've now industrialized that as part of the process for going forward into 2021. Many of the elements of the cash office we've retained. So, for example, um, this year we've launched a supply chain financing um, platform um, and with a goal to put uh, more than 1.9 billion euros onto that platform uh, this year from our supply base. So that's, 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 a, deliberate, that's a kind of a, a direct follow-on from um, what we did in extension of payment terms. Um, and once again, we're doing that very equitably 
with our supply chain. So we're entering into a lot of negotiations with what we call our A suppliers. So our top, our top 50 suppliers in each, in each cluster. Um, and, we, and we're negotiating with them and, and uh, making sure it's win-win, the supply chain financing platform. And finally, the negotiation accelerator. So the negotiation accelerator was something that we put into place probably July, August of last year. And that was a central team of people um, that were a bit separate from individual procurement categories, but they were kind of like a task force to go in and step in to a, a specific supplier negotiation to get the most out of that. So specialists in negotiation that were a bit detached from the supplier relationship in order to get that extra 5% that extra saving or that extra 10% saving. So, and that worked particularly well in, cer in certain areas, for example, in fuel. Negotiating fuel is actually very difficult because you, you're just basically uh, dependent on the, on the oil price. But there are certain areas where you can leverage um, negotiation capabilities. So this is what we've built into our, um, this is what we've built into our, uh, or we try to industrialize in 2021 based on our key learning from 2020 from the crisis. So um, in terms of learnings and outcomes, well, the major outcome was actually last week. Um, so first of all, it's worth mentioning that we actually, uh, we also picked up a gong at the uh, Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply. So, uh, um, so Andrew and I were, were there last week and um, basically uh, the, the award there was for um, uh, our reaction, resi supply chain resilience in a crisis. I always get confused what it's called, but supply chain resilience in a crisis. So, and uh, that's thanks to all the efforts, all of the hard hours that all of the teams put in, going through all of those invoices, going through all of those um, open POs, working together with the suppliers. So that's, uh, that's all credit, that, that's credit to, to, to the 350 people we have in the procurement organization. But related more to the content, well, the first impact of our experience in COVID-19 is the reputation and the profile of procurement within the Lufthansa group. So we're now raised. The board of directors knows who we are. They, they say, yes, we have a procurement organization in our company. Yeah. And, they, and because of that, we are now asked to perform even more. So we're now asked we get, you know, so we, uh, we have additional savings. We're looking now much more at uh, um, uh, getting much more value from procurement. Um, we have a lot of discussions right now about um, uh, how, we, uh, how we work within the new Lufthansa group, the new normal, yeah? Um, so, I mean, we've lost, for example, we had, as I mentioned earlier, we had 130,000 people in the group. But today, that's less than 100,000. So what does that mean for procurement? What does that mean for our supply base? How efficient do we need to be? What does, what does uh, uh, that mean for our external spend? Um, I also, I mentioned this earlier about uh, industrializing the zero-based approach, driving further the supply chain financing platform, which has actually worked um, very well. It got off to a, a bit of a slow start, but um, the more um, negotiation you put in the pipe for supply chain financing, the more that comes out in the end. And of course, our initial ambition was, was extremely ambitious because we were basing all of our numbers on 2019 spend. 20, 2021 spend is, I would say, when we get to December, it'll probably be less than half that we had in 2019. So our, our, our 2019 external spend was about 22 billion euros. By the end of 2021, our 2021 spend will probably be in the area of eight to nine billion. Um, yeah, protecting fragile suppliers. And I think that's something for the future, something that we all need to consider. Um, so now we're very conscious about that and we're looking to nurture suppliers. Um, and this comes into um, sustainability within the supply chain. So one of the hot topics in Germany and it's going to, it's going to become Europe-wide, but, but there's going to be a new law in Germany beginning on the 1st of January 2023. It's called the Lieferkettengesetz, supply chain law. And um, basically, it has everything to do with uh, protecting the supply chain, ensuring that human rights are respected within the supply chain uh, at a tier one, a tier two, and tier three, and so forth. And this is quite, quite stringent. So we're now working 
um, to ensure that that's, that's coming into place. We take that in incredibly serious within the Lufthansa Group. And then finally, competencies and skills. And I think um, Vodafone referred to this earlier. Um, the crisis has revealed that we have uh, a need for, to upskill and to change the skill set of our buyers, of our category managers, even of our um, divisional CPOs. Um, much more data driven, much more uh, analytical. Um, I fully agree with Ninian's comment about data science. Data science is very important within the procurement function, something that we're looking at right now and how we're utilizing digitalization to decide our future journey. So we currently, we're currently doing a, a kind of strategic review right now of where we, where we want to go on our digitalization journey. Do we want to focus purely on data, or do we want digitalization to, to enable efficiency, to reduce headcount, or do we want to utilize digitalization for something else? Could be just to, to ensure that we have more integration between our sourcing systems and our contract management and in our reporting and analytics. So, um, so that's the journey that we're currently on. But once again, it's all been provoked by, by the crisis. So um, overall, when I look back over the past 18 months, yes, it's been tough. And I will never, personally, I will never forget those, those days in March, April, May of, of last year. Um, it was, yeah, pretty, pretty full on. Um, but we got through it, and we got through it as a team. And the team, the procurement team, in Frankfurt, in Vienna, in Munich, in Hamburg, and, and all around the world, we're, we're much closer now, and we're, we, we feel stronger that we've gotten through this, this, uh, this, these times together. And hopefully, the good times are coming back, fingers crossed, um, and uh, we're in a, a stronger position now than we were going into the crisis. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, thank you, James, for that insight. I, I do have some questions that have come through to the app here, so I'm going to ask these. Um, now, you talked a lot about the moral stance that Lufthansa Group uh, took when dealing with the suppliers. Um, that's great, but are you actually seeing business benefits as a result of that now? Yeah, so the, the, um, this kind of hybrid approach of being aggressive with certain suppliers and, and I'm someone who's quite maverick within the procurement organization, so I'm always pushing the buyers to say, okay, you know, if you're speaking to, my, is there nobody from Microsoft? Yet? Okay, so, you know, if you're speaking to Microsoft or you're speaking to, you know, big IBM or, you know, these, these big IT suppliers, yeah, you know, they can afford it. They can, you know, let's push out our, our payments to 150 days. Um, the smaller guys, no, yeah, we, we wanted to work with them. So, and I think one of, the ben one of the business benefits that we've gotten from that is longer term relationships, longer term sustainable relationships. So, and that really helps us because in many cases we have monopolistic suppliers. So um, in many of the airports around the world we have um, ground, uh, ground handlers that are more or less in a monopoly position where our negotiation position isn't typically great because uh, um, but because we've helped them out during the crisis or, or let's say we've We've helped mitigate the risk. I wouldn't say helping them out, but we've mitigated the, a little bit their financial risks. So that's created a very strong partnership, and, and therefore, you know, we can we can leverage that going forward. Okay, I, I see there are some questions uh, jumping up here as well. Uh, we only have time really for one. So um, do you want to pick one of those ones? Did you have any kind of crisis plan in place for an event like the pandemic, or how do you drive change in a company the size of Lufthansa? Take your pick. Okay, I'm going to take the first one if that's okay. Sorry, for, sorry for, sorry for Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous. By the way, any of these questions that are um, addressed to the app, they they can be fed to James and all of our speakers as well. So these questions are not wasted. Um, if you all um, engage with the app, then all these questions can be asked, and you can um, interact with James directly through the app as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. So, yeah. So yep. over to you. So, yeah, the crisis plan, and this is something a great paradox in the aviation business because if you think of the past. 20 or 30 years, there's been a crisis in the aviation business basically every two years. Every, you had 9-11, you had SARS, you had the financial crisis. Um, what I would say is the, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a kind of the, the crisis to kind of, the, to cap them all. And um, so the short answer to the question is no, we didn't have a plan because we, nobody expected something of that, of that magnitude. Um, what I would say, however, is our saving grace has been um, the ability to come together 
um, across functions um, to react to the crisis and the great spirit there is within within Lufthansa and, and the, uh, I mean we say that the Lufthansa family and that can be a, quite a flippant phrase but it's it's this kind of family spirit coming together get, getting through it and I think um, so despite the fact that there was not really a, a formal plan a, a plan did come together very quickly and uh, and we were able to to, to work through that so um, yeah, but I think this is one of the key learnings for the future. Of course, we, we need to be prepared for whatever may happen. Um, the next big thing, of course, is um, sustainability within the supply chain um, as it impacts the aviation business, because, of course, this is the next big thing is, is you know, how, how uh, ecolog um, ecologically friendly is flying going to be in the future. And we, as, as one of the largest aviation groups in, in the world, we need to ensure that, that, that we're at the forefront there. And that has a huge impact on procurement, the supply chain, making sure that what we buy, the services and products that we buy are, are environmentally sustainable. Okay, great. All right, uh, everybody, James. Thank you, James. Great. Thank you. I just take that. Thank you.